I've got cellist Josh Gindel and uh, violist John Largesse here with me. They are two members of the Moreau String Quartet, and you guys have just completed a massive project, and that is releasing this box set of all the string quartets of Ludwig van Beethoven. We're talking a, a lot of quartets here, 16 different quartets, about eight and a half hours of music. And first of all, congratulations on this new release. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's been been a, a long process, but it's been really rewarding, and I think we're really proud of what we've put out. Yeah, the last time that we spoke, you had just released uh, number fourteen, which is Opus One Hundred and Thirty One, and you had a lot of great stories to tell, not only about your approach to the music, but also about the quartet, your quartet in particular. And I wonder if you both, uh, Josh and John, can give us a little 101, go back over the history a little bit of your ensemble and tell us uh, how it all began. You were out at uh, Oberlin, right? Yeah, we were founded in 1995. uh, So we're celebrating our 25th season this year. Um, And we were founded really just um, to get credit for chamber music at the conservatory at Oberlin. Daniel Ching, my colleague, our first violinist, and I were students there, and uh, we both loved playing string quartets. It was the thing that I think that we loved most about being musicians. And so we formed a quartet while we were students there um, that we intended to be fairly serious uh, and to play repertoire well and to rehearse a lot and be really committed to the, to the idea but not necessarily with the thinking that we would pursue this uh, long term as a career. And we were very lucky that we found two like-minded people very early on who shared that commitment and that love of chamber music and that love of string quartet repertoire. Uh, and we were able to go on and you know compete and win some competitions and things and, and start our career um, while we were still students in Ohio at the Oberlin Conservatory. Now, tell us uh, where the name comes from, for folks who don't know. Yeah, sure. Uh, The Miro Quartet is named after the surrealist Spanish artist, uh, Juan Miro. Um, And it's funny, we actually have a handful of stories that we tell, because we've been telling this story now for 25 years. Uh, But the real story, um, or at least as far as your listeners know, the real story is that Uh, When we were students at Oberlin, um, I was taking an art history course, and my professor had said uh, a quote from Miro, basically something along the lines of, in order to become a great artist, you have to be able to imitate the great masters before you. Um, You have to understand their technique, understand their thinking, understand the way they compose art. But when it comes to being an artist and being your own artist, you should create as soulfully as possible. Forget all of those things you learned, understanding that they still were there with you. All of that technique, all of that history, all of that that thinking is there. But when it comes to uh, creating your own art, you need to be soulful and be yourself. Um, and so I immediately went out and bought a couple of prints of Miro uh, to hang in my apartment in Oberlin, And uh, before I had time to run back, uh, we had a quartet rehearsal and I threw them on the table. And one of our members um, said, what is that? And I explained in my literal sophomoric knowledge of Miro Mm -hmm. uh, who it was and what he stood for. And uh, that was it. Somebody said, let's call ourselves the Miro Quartet. And and that's where we are now, 25 years later. I'm looking at the uh, box set of uh, quartets here and seeing... What looks like, well, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's a, a painting by Juan Miro that you've got on the uh, CD covers. Well, the, the artwork was designed specifically for the CD, and your listeners may or may not know, but the Fundacion Miro, which is run by his children, uh, is very jealous about copyrights for ah. his original artworks. So we would, ha- um, that is not an original Miro, that is a Miro inspired graphic. Uh, that was designed for us for this uh, release specifically. So I'm glad you got that impression. <laughs> I'm also glad we didn't have to pay a million dollars for an actual uh, permission to use one of his pictures on our CD. Yeah, a win-win situation. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, 
I've uh, read in print you're talking about how this was a huge uh, embarkment of the uh, quartet to, to record all of these string quartets, kind of similar to, you know, the fact that Beethoven's string quartets are a massive part uh, of his output as well. Can you talk a little bit about your journey as a quartet in recording all of these uh, string quartets of Beethoven? I mean, t- this year is, you know, the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth. Did you always have your eye on that as a release date for these, this uh, box set? It's a good question. I mean, originally when we started, um, of course, some of these Beethoven quartets were some of the very first pieces we learned as a young quartet 25 years ago. Um, And we came up with the idea, 2003, 2004, that we wanted to record all the Beethoven quartets in the cycle. That was something that we artistically were committed to. And we thought we would do it um, ideally when each of us as members the quartet age was the same age that Beethoven was when he wrote the pieces. We kind of figured we'd follow in our own artistic growth the arc of Beethoven's artistic growth and discovery and writing these pieces. So when we recorded the Opus 18s, we were actually all between the ages of 27 and 30, which were the same age, uh, two years in which Beethoven wrote these pieces. Um, And I do think in a certain way, now looking back, there is a youthfulness that we bring to those pieces uh, that maybe we wouldn't bring now that I think is kind of very appropriate to the freshness and uh, very much matches maybe Beethoven's own attitude and time of life. Uh, As we continued, we did do the Razumovskis, the middle quartets, again, in our mid-30s, same time, more or less, when Beethoven was writing them. And then after we had completed that project, um, we were looking ahead and thinking, as you mentioned, yes, the 250th is coming up. Do we really want to wait another 10 years <laughs> to do the late quartets, to even start them? Uh, and we said, you know what? No. Let's move ahead. Let's see if we can actually complete the project by the Beethoven anniversary. And let's see if we can find a old and mature soul in our quartet without actually being uh, in our late 50s. Well, I'm glad you didn't wait until you were in your 50s to take on those uh, late string quartets. We concern ourselves with uh, making sure that we're still able to play the late string quartets. (laughs) So waiting waiting may, uh, you know, complicates that a little bit. Yeah. Well, I was looking at your bios uh, for both you, Josh, and for John as well. And I noticed you guys are both like very physically active. You know, uh, Josh, you you're, describe yourself as a gym rat and you, you play tennis. And John, uh, you're a yoga instructor. Is that right? Yes. You know, I, I uh, am a certified yoga instructor. I, about 10 years ago, was teaching a lot of classes here in Austin where I live. And to be honest, the more successful the string quartet, the Moreau has become. And the less I've been around, the more we've been touring on the road. I now no longer teach any regular classes. All of my uh, fellow instructors got angry that they were always subbing for me for my classes. Uh And I said, you know what? I think I should just give you my class and I can come and sub for you occasionally. (laughs) Um, But I think everybody in the quartet Uh, All four of us are very aware of keeping our physical and mental health uh, in in tip-top shape. It's playing string instruments is very athletic, uh, and it takes – It's in some ways it's also very unnatural and can be a big stress on the human body. Certainly the amount of travel we do, airplanes, time changes, uh, late nights sometimes, early mornings for an early flight other times. Uh, It's easy for your body to take a beating as well as your mind. And uh, for us, keeping ourselves individually fit and healthy and relaxed allows us to serve the music in the best possible way. And also we have to be friendly and nice with each other. Otherwise, we'll kill each other uh, in rehearsals if we're seeing each other every day and someone's feeling bad or grumpy. So we're taking care of each other by taking care of ourselves. So have you gotten your colleagues interested in yoga as well? Actually, our second violinist, Will, just started doing regular yoga this year. I won't take any credit for that, but (laughs) um, he now has an online uh, yoga class that he does, and he's finding that that helps him a lot. Um, Our first violinist likes to go for jogs and run. 
um, and also do things like skiing and being outdoors. And I think all of us like to burn off some steam in that way. Well, I was just curious about how that plays into your performing because I hear a certain athleticism uh, from the entire quartet in the way that you approach these Beethoven string quartets. We've talked about sort of the three different periods during which Beethoven wrote these works, those early ones that are more in the mold of his teacher Haydn and Mozart, and the middle quartets, the Razumovskis and a couple others. But the final period, those five late string quartets, really get into, I think, the uh, the underbelly of you know what we think of when we think of Beethoven, the tortured soul, creating music that is both uh, you know tortured as well, but also incredibly hopeful and beautiful. Can you talk a little bit about those later period quartets and your approach to them? Yeah, his. These late quartets are just monstrous and masterful, and he's pushing boundaries and really exploring kind of the most uh, intimate parts of his own personality and his own soul. Um, I really think that for the late quartets, he th- this was his way of expressing what he wanted to get out there. He wasn't concerned about um, you know making money and 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 taking commissions so that he could he could make ends meet but using the quartets because again the the medium is so intimate uh with just four players you know a single voice playing a part um he really used it to just sort of stretch his boundaries he he talked a lot about you know and he told musicians of the time this music's not for you this is music of the future this is music that is meant to kind of push boundaries and 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 do something with the string quartet that has never been done before. Um, and you feel that when you're playing them. I mean, even the the, the, the more classical movements, the more traditional movements, um, they're just so different than anything we've ever heard before. Um, and so it's, it's, it's just been a great joy for us. I mean, over 25 years to be able to explore these works and Every time we come back to them and every time we play them, even if it's something that we've been playing, like the Grosse Fuga, for example, f- since, you know, 1996, um, we learn something different. We see something different in the music. We, we find a, a, a theme that's hidden or, a, or a, a texture that we never realized was so impactful. Uh, so we're just constantly learning with these works. And I wish, you know, I could say that these recordings are perfect, but unfortunately recording is just a snapshot in time. Uh, It is how we viewed these late quartets when we recorded them, uh, as opposed to, you know, that may change in five years or ten years. Uh, But that's one of the great joys of live music and also one of the great joys of us being able to explore these works continually for hopefully, you know, another 25 years. Yeah. Um, they, they just continue to reveal themselves to us. Well, maybe you will come back uh, in your 50s and, and re-record those late quartets someday down the road. Well, we'll, we'll see about that. Uh, <laughs> it was tiring enough over the last 15 years to do everything once. So <laughs> we'll see. But I, I we'll never say never, right? Right, yeah. Uh, before I let you go, I just want to mention, you, you told us it's your 25th anniversary, but you've got this really interesting uh, project online called the Quartet Archive, which is about American concerts. Do you want to tell us about that very quickly? Sure. Um, well, you know, when we were thinking about our anniversary and also how the Beethoven cycle was going to be a big part of that anniversary, we were also thinking about what we could do to celebrate it that wouldn't necessarily be Beethoven or perhaps have no Beethoven on it. And um, we've been conscious, the Moreau Quartet, as we're turning 25, more and more about how much we owe as artists to our mentors. Uh, the older quartets that taught us, that inspired us when we were young, when we were starting out, and also, frankly, the great quartets that inspired and taught our own teachers. Um, And being more conscious of us as part of this 
long chain of this living art form that's handed from generation to generation. You can't really learn how to play as a great string quartet from a book or from a video. I mean, you really need to learn it, uh, seeing it happen and being taught in person with someone who really understands it. And so for us being conscious of the great lineage of string quartets in the United States particularly um, and what that goes back to, we decided to program three different concert programs that were actually recreations of programs that three great quartets had brought forth in our country, 1910, 1925, uh, 1935 the Flanzali Quartet, the Kneisel Quartet, and the Kolisch Quartet. And all three of these quartets were doing things uh, for the first time. The Kneisel Quartet, for example, was the first professional touring string quartet in the United States. They started the first concert series of chamber music in New York City. Uh, they started numerous other si series all over the United States. The Flanzali Quartet was the first to record. Again, all these great quartets that started things and created uh, a world that we now live in. And um, we thought we'd celebrate it by actually playing some of their own programs and hoping to talk to the audience and teach the audience a little bit about their history. Yeah, it's a fascinating concept. Well, folks can uh, learn about that as well as everything that you guys do at your website. That is MiroQuartet.com. Cellist Josh Gindel and violist John Largesse, two members of the Miro String Quartet, Again, the Beethoven Complete String Quartet's just out on the Pentatone label. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on FM 91. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you.